We are back, you are chatting with John P. Today, we are going to be talking about some watch brands that collectors love a whole lot. They enjoy these watch brands a lot, but I myself do not talk about them very much, if at all. As well, some of these watch brands are just not covered too much in the watch news, the watch media, and some of the blogs that many of you love and enjoy. I'm going to be explaining a little bit about the brands and why that is. Now, some of you may really enjoy these watch brands, including the first brand, which we'll talk about in just a second. So, uh, you know, please do not get too kind of rustled up if, if you feel, you know, maybe I uh, didn't drive home the point or maybe um, you disagree, but please leave that in the comments below because that's what's so great about watches today is everyone has their preferences and what they really love. And maybe you could turn, you know, a fellow watch collector on to one of these brands or one of the models of these brands and why you love and enjoy it so much. And, you know, someone may strike uh, that similarity with you. So make sure to voice your opinions in the comments below. On the wrist today, I have a Rolex Oyster Perpetual Red Grape the uh, the purple dial op39 now discontinued and it's really a shame that they discontinued these dial variations because while the new rolex oyster perpetuals by the way they don't make a 39 anymore they've got a 36 and a 41 uh, which some say is you know maybe um they're overlooking the perfect size hint the 39 um which Federico, who has an eight entrance and myself a six and a half, can both wear comfortably. Uh, but the dials are just much different on the OPs today. You know, this is much more of a metallic dial in the older style. Now it's much more flat, which is in line with kind of an entry level piece, but that's Rolex, right? Also, guys, please do not forget to check out DelrayWatch.com, where we've been working just so tirelessly to bring just cool new watches. Um, for you, obviously, we deal in pre-owned watches. We have a new watch section as well with some, some new brands that I believe we added uh, recently. But also, we just get so many cool pieces in the door, um, including a couple of Javril Tribecas. We will mention Javril here today, uh, but I know that there's a couple of you out there that have been asking recently. So, watch brands that people love a whole lot, but they do not get talked about. The first brand is going to be Union Glashuta. Now, some of you outside of the United States are going to say, well, hey, John, I hear about this quite a bit, and this is perhaps going to be in Russia, in, in certain countries in Europe, perhaps newer markets in Europe, as well as, I believe, the Caribbean, and maybe one or two Latin American countries. This brand, now owned by Swatch Group, I believe since maybe 1996, they kind of revitalize the brand and they produce watches in the vein of Glashuta Original, right? I mean, they're not the same brand, though they, they produce watch models that look a lot like pieces or offerings you'd see from Glashuta Original. At least they're more simplistic watches. Their whole German watchmaking aesthetic and uh, ideology behind this brand is conveyed through this line and they really do have some pretty sharp and interesting pieces and the price points are i would say a little bit higher than you'd see from a longine at a comparable quality now they do not offer this brand in the united states swatch group owns many brands including the loved omega and many others of course but they do not offer this brand in the united states and so that immediately removes so many influencers magazines um, you know, newspapers, things that are going to be attracting watch collectors to the brand, they're, they, they just not even, are they just not aware of this brand necessarily? They also do not have access to the watches because of the way that Swatch has their distribution ch chain. So sure, you could technically buy one on Chrono24. There are, you know, secondhand and gray market dealers that sell the watches. In fact, I believe we actually had just one in the history of Delray watch. And I will say that the watch was, you know, okay quality, much in line with what you would see at the few thousand dollar price point they use at a movement. So you're getting stuff that they, you know, swatches putting in all the rest of their products um, with the exception of their in-house movements that they use and their coaxial with Omega, so on and so forth. So aside from the fact that there's really no reason for these watch outlets to be covering the watches because in that market, they can't be sold. 
The reality is the, the United States market is incredibly competitive and increasingly so every day. You have micro brands that are coming out left and right quite literally every day and you see that on websites that take in reviews uh, or review requests, paid review requests like a blog to watch and even Hodinkee with their kind of uh, advertorials as they call them. Uh, that might be changing now with the LVMH uh, par our partnership slash acquisition, but you get the picture. It's really difficult and for Swatch to hit the US market and kind of trickle out some of these more difficult, more matured product markets, um, even China, that could just be something that they're not willing to take on considering these watches, these German watches kind of already exist and that price point is incredibly fierce. It probably just does not make sense for them to do so. Though they might, I think in the coming years we could see Swatch actually hit the United States market because they did this with Certina recently and they also did this with um, Mido in the last few years and those seem to be going okay. I mean Certina and Mido kind of uh, just below the price point of Union Glashuta but um, I think time will tell on this one. And once again, I don't think the watches, there's anything negative to say about them. In fact, I quite like some of their designs, but there seems to be just so much overlap in the US market and they don't offer them here. So we'll see in the future, but that is why the first brand, Union Glashuta, is not really talked about a whole lot. Next, we have a Russian watch brand, originally Russian, now with a Lithuanian offshoot called Vostok Europe, the watch brand being Vostok. Now this is a Soviet era watch brand that was producing movements for the Soviet military and they were tasked with building a rugged and durable watch in which they came up with the Amphibia. Now not only do they have the Amphibia but they also produce a watch that also is a cult classic and this is the Kamenderski which is kind of a uh, military officer style watch and I believe it has a 24 hour 24 hour markers instead of your traditional 12. They may have a couple different versions. That's the thing with this brand and others like it is there's a lot of variations. There's not really a real product catalog. There's been a lot of changes over time and kind of just build it as you see fit mentality. And that comes with the territory because we're talking about, you know, $75 US dollar watch. And perhaps in Russia currently, the watches may even go for less. Now, I was really introduced to this brand a, a long time ago, of course, because once again, the Amphibia particularly has this long-standing cult following of being a rugged, durable watch that you really can beat up, not spend a whole lot on, and you probably doesn't need to get serviced far too often. I mean, you might be okay with going 45 seconds in error per day, but some people are okay when they truly want a watch they can beat up rough and tumble. I know you Amphibia guys, please leave in the comments below. Convince me to purchase one. I may actually do it and make a little bit of a, a write-up or a vlog or you know a week on the wrist, I think, they sometimes do. So if you want to see that, leave that in the comments below because I genuinely want to see how these things wear because I've held them but you know I haven't spent like considerable amount of time with one of these on my wrist and I know some of you out there really, really enjoy these. But I was at a, a watch event with Federico, Federico Talks Watches years ago and someone had an entire briefcase, what is it called, like a Pelican, those plastic, you know, durable cases that sometimes they put other valuables, cameras, uh, so on and so forth. But he had so many variations. He had the uh, the scuba dude, as you all know, that has the scuba guy on the dial of the amphibia, and so many others. I think he had the Cyrillic lettering, um, which is you know what they use for the, the Russian language and, and many others. Uh, but they also had, I believe, an English version that was produced maybe for the U.S. markets and English-speaking markets. And he had every single one. And this person, they just absolutely were willing to die by the sword for this watch. And it, it really struck kind of a note with me because up until that point, I hadn't seen anyone be so ingrained and stand by any particular brand and model as much as Seiko collectors. Back then, Seiko and Grand Seiko particularly was very, very niche. It still is, but back then, you know, whenever this five, six, seven, eight years ago, perhaps at this point, when that event was happening, it was, you really had to be, it was like a cult following. There was no, really no US market for it. So the Grand Seiko collectors, and I had never seen anyone defend. There was everyone talking about their favorite watches, Patek Philippe, Audemars Piguet and all these, and this 
guy was really out there talking about the nuances, and you could tell he spent so much time researching these, uh, you know, these original Soviet-era movement designs and why they're rugged, durable, and why the engineering was superior to anything you could find today. Now, but why do we not talk about this more? Have the branding, right? Branding is a big part of watches and watch community, right? Rolex, people go crazy for these things. Um, but, you know, certainly they're not any much better than, uh, you know, an Omega Seamaster or something like that for that matter at a fraction of the, the, the price secondhand. Once again, arguably, but I have done videos where I've shown that spec for spec. Uh, you get into the branding and the thing with Vostok is, well, they have a, a, a like a Lithuanian uh, licensed brand out there. It's not the same. They don't offer the Amphibia. You have to buy the watches from a seller like Moscow watch seller on eBay or there's an Amazon seller, which I think is just doing arbitrage with the products. Uh, and so you get into that, there's just not a brand behind it. Apparently the factory exists, but they filed for, you know, Russian bankruptcy some years ago. And, and so, you know, what do you do at that point? You don't have a brand behind that. Sure, the community works with them and they find their watchmakers, much like the vintage Seiko collectors, but there's really not a brand that's pushing, in my opinion, that's pushing this forward and trying to, to gain the attention. And so you don't have marketing budgets, you don't have you know, the Hodinkis, the blog to watch is all these guys talking about it. You don't have the paid YouTube sponsorships that some people out there do with micro brands. And so it's just kind of this thing out there and it's more of a design. It's more, it's, it's almost like DeFi, if you're familiar, like, you know, decentralized finance. It's almost like that, but for watches, sure. I mean, the, the movements and the parts are coming from one place, probably, uh, but there, there's not really a clear centralized distribution chain, and so no one's paying for the mentions, no one's talking about it. There's just no money in it for anyone besides, you know, I guess the people that are doing the arbitrage and the selling secondhand, as well as the original factory that apparently is producing the movement. So that is Vostok, but please guys, leave in the comments below if you wanna see maybe a, a week on the wrist with one of these amphibias. I think that's a pretty cool idea. Next, we have Javril. Now, Javril, probably the most notable watch that they have is the Tribeca. We have two of them at Delray Watch. We've had about a dozen the last year. They were stuck in the back of another dealer safe. We pulled them out, we sold them because it looks like your legendary Rolex Paul Newman and the case quality and construction is there. I mean, it, it feels like a vintage watch, even a little bit better probably. Um, you know, let, let you be the, the decider if you have one of these or felt one, leave in the comments below. But the thing with Javril and the Javril group is it's really a group of watch dealers that were in the jewelry industry that kind of licensed names from, I believe, like a Roberto Cavalli and these other fashion brands, and they'd slap them on these kind of, you know, piece together watches for a long time and they'd sell them. And some of the watches would be of really great quality and some maybe not so much. Like just the other day we were offered a, uh, a not, I believe it was like, a, a, supposed to be like a 5711, but it was from a Javril group and a very cool watch. But the thing with the Javril group is, and I haven't ha held that particular watch, so I'm not specifically talking uh, about that Javril Nautilus design, but the thing is there's not a lot of consistency with the exception of maybe the Tribeca, but even arguably there's differences and there's not a great product catalog and it comes down to this branding, right? And so if you don't have the Javril group going out there and first of all, having enough quality to where they can actually impress the bloggers, impress you know the, the Hodinkis, the writers, all the media, enough to where they're even willing to take the money to be able to write about it because they have to stand behind what they say. If they don't have the consistency in the products, it's going to be a really tough sell unless maybe it's a new brand and no one knows better, but Javril has been around for so long. I mean, maybe 20 years at this point in different forms, um, gone through different owners and changeover. And I, I believe right now they, they maybe even uh, have an office on 47th Street, but there has been many accounts of other brands' movements and rotors being put into brand new Javril watches and GV2, which is they're supposed to be like more avant-garde younger watches. And so there's not a lot of consistency behind the brand. Um, and that's why with that, you just don't see the marketing budget either. The product catalog is not really standardized. They kind of just come out with things. And that's what Frank Mueller was doing uh, a long time ago, by the way, when they were trying to keep up with demand. They just did it on a, in a more sophisticated manner. But I think where Javril really does sit currently is mostly the fashion watch area. And they just happen to have their line, which is Swiss made. And, 
you know, it doesn't really gain a lot of momentum because it's not standardized. They don't have like a product everyone knows them for besides the Tribeca, which is not a long-standing product line. And once again, I'm not really saying anything negative about it because I do think that they've made some really cool and great, you know, seemingly great pieces over time. And I've held Javril watch and I think they, some of them are like in line with what you would get in that $3,000 under region, you know, Swiss movements, Swiss made for the most part. Um, but they just don't have like really any push behind them, in my opinion, to really captivate collectors. What do you think about Jabril? Leave it in the comments below. And by the way, you can see that I clearly not biased because even though we do have two uh, Jabril Tribecas in stock, I'm not saying, you know, you should buy it necessarily. Unless, of course, you like it, then I will not stop you. Delray Watch. Next, guys, we have a watch brand. And lastly, that has really hit the watch collecting community by storm the last few years. And this is Kurono Tokyo. This is the new approachable brand by Hajime Asaoka out of Japan, a very high-end independent watchmaker that is known mostly for his movement designs, his tourbillon. He has a couple of special designs that, has, that have won him awards, and he really is a master, master, not only craftsman, but of course, watchmaker. And he had this whole idea in the last few years, and he, he originally was the designer, now I believe he's part owner. There are other people involved, and he, these things are produced in the hundreds, um, so obviously it's not just him, you know, assembling these watches and putting the Miyota movements in them. Uh, but in the last few years, these watches have really started to sell out. They recently released a watch to kind of try to curb the flipping because these were like $2,000 watches in that range, depending on the model. They had a chrono for a little bit more, but they would be posted on chrono 24 for like seven, eight, nine thousand dollars $9,000. This guy believes in the spirit behind watchmaking, loves what he does, wants to put something approachable on people's wrists, couldn't do it with his master uh, in-house movements that he was designing and making. So he made this, uses the Miyota, uh, the high grade version and, you know, tuning things up and also, you know, finally finishing the case and making a nice dial. But they came out with one recently and to kind of curb this flipping, there was a 10 minute window where if you logged on at a certain time, they would fill every order that came in in the 10 minute window and we're finding that these watches are also going above the, uh, the retail price, or at least they're attempting to be. But I'll say why this watch brand is not talked about. Actually, I take that back. It's talked about a lot, but it's increasingly less talked about, in my opinion. Now, this is maybe not by all of the media sources, because at a certain point, they run out of paid advertorial to run, and they have to talk about something. So why not talk about something of quality, which is going to be this Hajime Asaoka Corono line. So that's kind of, you know, it becomes filler at a certain point. And they're just cool watches. Many people uh, would agree. But I, I see it being talked about less. So this is more of kind of a bonus, and it, it really kind of dawned on me that it's being talked about less, and more people are trying to get out of these. At Delray Watch, we've recently turned down a few people that have graciously uh, tried to, to sell these to us, want to know if we wanted to add them to our inventory. And we, to be very honest, we have a chronograph that's been in our inventory for maybe a few months now. And I would say six, seven, eight months ago, these things were flying off the shelf like hotcakes. And we haven't received one query. No one's called, emailed, or texted. And we get you know dozens and dozens and dozens for literally all the other products. Um, but no one's asked about this, and so I kind of thought this is this is something interesting to, to share with you as watch collectors as a bonus because I see people speculating a lot, not advocating like, let's become traders, uh, but people are speculating in watches, and if you're going to do that, and there's less media coverage maybe, I mean, I think we're at the early point of that, but there's less people talking about this brand as they come out with more watches. The, the brand itself has made uh, statements that they're looking to curb down on the flipping, which is probably going to pull back that secondary market price. And that's kind of the idea that Hajime Asaoka, the namesake of the brand, has behind the brand is for everyone to have an approachable, high quality watch on the wrist. It says it right on their website. So it makes sense that they're doing this. Um, but why personally more people don't talk about it is they're just not too sure yet of where it's going to go. I mean, we're talking about a brand that's using that almost that kind of Ming strategy 
but this is a brand that goes by the namesake of the master watchmaker. If he no longer becomes part of it, it may die like you see something like a Daniel Roth or you know, arguably the Gerald Genta, which, yeah, sure, Bulgari owns them, but, you know, they're really not being done with anything. So you don't see a lot of people kind of necessarily supporting that in the mainstream anymore, but that one's a bit more of a stretch compared to the others, I will admit. Just thought it was interesting to share. What do you guys think about the Corona watches by Hajime Asaoka, I would love to hear it. And also make sure to leave your comments below what you think about the week on the wrist with the Vostok Amphibia. I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to do the vlog style and see what it does. Who knows? Maybe I'll love it. Maybe it'll stop. Maybe it'll keep perfect time. I really don't know. Leave that in the comments below. Thanks guys. You've been chatting with John P. Ciao.